with us today. The Restoration Appreciation Week was an idea that started several years ago. John Nugent and others have come together to see what we could do to help to refocus and think about the future of what the restoration movement is. Yes, to, to think about the past and the meaning that it has for us, but especially about where do we go from here and how important this idea, this movement has for the Christian churches and churches of Christ. And I'm so glad that uh, we have that here on the campus of Great Lakes Christian College. Well, Jerry Harris is the lead pastor of The Crossing, which is a multi-site mega church based in Quincy, Illinois, and planted in several communities ranging in population from 125 to 40,000. Uh, under Jerry's leadership, The Crossing has grown from 230 people to over 8,000 people at 10 locations in Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa, with thousands more joining online. Outreach Magazine has consistently named The Crossing among the top 100 fastest growing and largest churches in America. Jerry is the author of Micropolitan Church and also a book called 50 Days, and he is now publisher of The Christian Standard and The Lookout as of March 2017, and I have a copy of The Christian Standard. I'm a subscriber and really appreciate the articles and talking about the church and what we need to be doing as a people of God. Uh, Jerry is an original member of the Solomon Foundation and also chairman of the board of CARE India, a mission located in southeastern India. He and his wife Allison have four grown children who are all in ministry and we are really blessed to have his wife Allison with us today. Allison, if you'd stand. Thank you for your applause. Thank you for coming to be here. <clears throat> Jerry's connection with the Christian Standard is important, important to me personally. My father was director of editorial production at Standard, and he always talked about the importance of this company and its publications in helping to produce a point of unity among our churches. That company was about one month away from closing its doors forever until the Solomon Foundation stepped up to purchase it and then asked Jerry to serve as its publisher. Since then, the Christian Standard has become an excellent publication that serves to educate, inspire, and unify churches around the world. The last thing I want to say about Jerry is this. His work with the Solomon Foundation, which is a Christian organization dedicated to help provide resources for kingdom enterprises, has helped to keep the doors of Great Lakes Christian College open and open wide. Two years ago, we entered into a partnership with the Solomon Foundation and their financial support has allowed this college to move forward with a greater confidence in the future and enabled us to maintain the quality and excellence for which we are known. Without their faith in God and their faith in us, GLCC would not be here today. So I want to say thank you to Jerry and to the Solomon Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this morning, Jerry Harris. Welcome him, please. Thank you. Well, how are you doing, Great Lakes Christian College? You look good. You clean up nice. Everybody's breath was nice this morning. I don't know if mine is, but this is weird. I'm not used to having a pulpit. It's kind of it's neat. I want to pass something around. Now, this is not going to appear precious. This is not going to appear valuable, but it actually is very valuable. So be careful when you have it. Don't drop it. Don't think this isn't very important. I just want you to hold it and pass it on. I'd like everybody to be able to hold on to it because it has a great deal of significance and I'm not really pulling your leg. It's, it, it's really true. And I'll explain it to you as, uh, as you pass it around. You'll notice that it looks like it's made of concrete, which it is, and there's some painting on it. Um, <clears throat> Barton Stone is the earliest, probably first person that we could talk about. We've talked about the Restoration Movement. It's Genesis. And uh, one of his famous sayings was, let Christian unity be our polar star. And the idea of unity is a really powerful, it's a very important, uh, illuminating 
idea. And the idea of polar star being that one star that doesn't move or that doesn't appear to move in the sky, that always stays in the same place, is absolutely critical to this movement. Now, not, I'm not saying unity at all costs, but I'm saying this is something that needs to be striven for. And a lot of times, relationships aren't easy. You have to fight for them, and you have to lean into them, and you have to endure things, and there has to be a lot of forbearance. So, does anybody have any idea? Where is the, where's, where's the piece of the, of, uh, yeah, okay. Does anybody have any idea what that is? Looks like mortar. Any idea, guys? No idea yet? It's a piece of the Berlin Wall. Okay, now the Berlin Wall was a wall that separated East and West Berlin. It was the symbol of the Iron Curtain. Uh, people would, on the east side of uh, Berlin, would try to scale the wall. Many were killed. Uh, trying to get o over into the West because it symbolized the difference between totalitarianism and freedom. And uh, when I grew up, uh, it was an iconic uh, reminder of, of the Cold War, of the difference between being in freedom and being in tyranny. In 1987, June the 12th, Ronald Reagan gave a speech at the Brandenburg Gate, which is the famous gate at the Berlin Wall. And in that speech, he delivered his most famous line of his entire presidency. What's interesting about that line is that his speechwriters over and over again tried to get him to take it out of his speech. And he kept putting it back into his speech, even to the point where he was on Air Force One and he was traveling over to Berlin and it was taken out a final time and he called his speechwriter over to him on the plane, and he said, I have a question for you. Who's the President of the United States? And his, uh, his speechwriter said, you are, Mr. President. He goes, put the line back in. So when he was there in June of 1987, th these were the words that he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It became prophetic because two years later that wall did come down. And my brother was there in Berlin the day that it was coming down. And uh, these huge sections of wall were being removed. And he took the opportunity to get a piece of that wall. So the painting, there's all sorts of graffiti uh, on that wall. And the, the paint that you see on that piece of concrete is part of the graffiti that was on this wall that symbolized the division between freedom and tyranny. And uh, that wall stood for 27 years. And I can tell you this, people at the time considered the removal of that wall impossible, that that could never happen. That wall would always be there. There would always be this division we called the Iron Curtain. And yet it no longer exists. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about walls. I want to talk to you about the things that come between us, that divide us, that keep us from experiencing the unity that the Restoration Movement talked about and that God wants us to enjoy and benefit from. I want to uh, fast forward my own personal life to the October of 2003. It was my 44th birthday. You can figure out how old I am now. And uh, I was in Milhausen, Germany. Uh, we supported a church there, and Milhausen is actually in what was formerly Eastern Germany, East Germany, which uh, when I was younger was the enemy. Like if you were at the Olympics, if you were watching the Olympics, the East Germans were ruthless, they were cheaters, they were horrible, and uh, you couldn't stand the East German team, right? And, and they would win things, but everybody knew they were cheating and things like that. Anyway, Milhausen, Germany is in what was formerly Eastern Germany. We were there, and, uh, and it was my birthday on a Sunday, and the person who was housing me, a doctor, said he wanted to treat me to something special for my birthday. In Germany, birthdays are a big deal. And, uh, and so, and he, you know, we'd been talking about different things. He knew I was a minister, things along those lines. And uh, he wanted to drive me to the capital city, of what was uh, formerly East Germany, and that's Erfurt, East Germany. 
And uh, we were driving along the road and talking to one another. What was interesting is this guy and every uh, man or woman his age, back when uh, East Germany was a country of its own, part of the Eastern Soviet bloc, they all had to serve in the military. He had to serve in the military. So he was an East German military officer. So technically, X number of years before that, he was my enemy. Now I'm traveling in a car with my enemy. And we're driving to Erfurt, Germany. By the way, Erfurt was uh, the, uh, not only the capital, it was where the headquarters of the Stasi was. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the Stasi, but it was the East German secret police and people walked into the building that was the Stasi and never walked out. It was where people were tortured, all sorts of things like that happened in the Stasi. And so here we are driving to Erfurt, Germany. It's a little surreal to me. Okay, because I'm with this guy who would have been my enemy, but now he's not my enemy. And we're talking about Jesus because we're both Christians. And we stop along the side of the road and we have a bratwurst, you know, and, and we're, you know, having lunch together. And we're talking about what only God can do and how amazing it is that God can do it while he's trying to treat me a, pretty much a stranger to something special on my 44th birthday. And it, it caused me to reflect on how those walls between cultures and ideologies and all those things could actually come down. And now he's my host and he's treating me to something a a actually wonderful. He was actually there the day that uh, the East German government fell without firing a shot. He could look behind him. The city center was where that happened and he could look behind him and he could see the smoke rising from the Stasi because they were trying to burn all of the files before the revolutionaries got in there and, and discovered, you know, who had done what and where all the bodies were buried. But it was, it was remarkable to me to see how those walls could come down. Once we got to Erfurt, Germany, the, the, uh, the gift he gave me was to take me to a Catholic monastery. It wasn't just any Catholic monastery. It was the Catholic monastery where Martin Luther studied and took his vows to be a Catholic priest. So we went on a tour, <coughs> excuse me, of that monastery and uh, it was all in German. There wasn't an English tour, only a German tour. And I can speak a little German, but not a lot. And so this doctor was next to me, and he's whispering in my ear, translating as we go through. And, uh, and so I'm listening to him, and I'm looking at the various things that uh, are, you know, important, seeing that Martin Luther is kind of the father of the, Re of the Reformation, right? And uh, they get into the sanctuary part of the of the monastery and it's known for a particular individual that uh, was the bishop of that monastery and then died and was buried uh, up in the pulpit area and there's a big stone that commemorates his death and his name was Johannes Zachariah. Now Johannes Zachariah is somebody that probably in church history or if you've taken church history or rest you probably never heard of that guy but uh, you've probably heard of a guy named John Huss. How many of you heard of John Huss before? Okay, John Huss was burnt at the stake for his Reformation ideas, right? <coughs> and the person that oversaw the tribunal and the eventual burning of the stake of John Huss was Johannes Zacharias, who wanted to make it his, his life's work to stamp out anything that was anti-Catholicism. And so when Martin Luther decided to take his vows as a priest, the night before he took those vows, he went into that same uh, chapel where I was. He got down on his face on the stone that a hundred years before Johannes Zacharias was buried in a crucifix position. And he prayed to God all night long that the spirit of Johannes Zacharias would fill him. So that he could be as much of a proponent for the Catholic faith as the man who burnt John Huss at the stake. Doesn't God have an awesome sense of humor? Isn't that like the Apostle Paul all over again? Oh, this is what you want to be, Martin Luther? You have no idea what plans I have for you. It was amazing to see in that moment of history 
how this guy, Martin Luther, who wanted to be a proponent, a champion for Catholicism, would end up becoming a sledgehammer that was just hammering at the wall of Catholicism and dropping that wall down that had lasted for over 1,100 years and became part of the genesis of the Reformation. A couple of days after that, we traveled to a town called Eisenach, where the Wartburg Castle is. Uh, Luther hid here after being excommunicated by the Catholic Church. Now, that's an easy, nice way of saying it. Actually, he went to a tribunal. It was called the Diet of Worms or Worms in France. And as soon as he walked out of that, he was fair game. Anyone could kill him uh, because of him being an apostate. And there were people that threw a bag over his head, threw him over a horse, and spirited him away to this castle in East Germany, in Eisenach, Germany, called the Wartburg. <clears throat> now Martin Luther was absolutely sure he was going to be killed in a hurry. So he decided that the best thing he could do in his last moments of life was to translate the New Testament from Greek into German so anyone could read it. Do you know how long it took him? How long do you think it would take to translate an entire New Testament from one language into another? It took him 11 weeks. 11 weeks. And until recently, the Lutheran church was still using uh, his translation. And he did that because he thought in any moment he would be killed. Think about what getting the New Testament in a common man's language did for walls. If only doctors, lawyers, and ministers were able to read God's Word, how many people were locked out? How many people had walls around them? And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther changes, <coughs> excuse me, changes the entire equation, and he translates the Bible. The very same thing that John Huss was burned at the stake for. Isn't it interesting? 300 years after Martin Luther, there was a man named Barton Stone, who wanted to preach a simple message of the gospel. He was in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, and they would do a common communion service, and they'd ask Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and all sorts of other people to come in and participate in a unity service, a common communion service, and a revival broke out. Well, he was a Presbyterian, and so Presbyterians were Calvinists. So they believed that God predetermined everybody who was lost and saved, and you didn't have any choice in that. <coughs> I have a cough, so please forgive me. But he had heard a guy preach a sermon saying this. This is really, really deep theology. Are you ready? Jesus loves everybody. <coughs> it captured him. Jesus loves everybody. Not just the people he chose, but everybody. And so he went back and he started preaching, Jesus loves everybody. And the Presbyterian Church said, you can't preach that. You have to preach according to the Westminster Confession. And the Westminster Confession says that there's some people that are elected to be lost and some people that are elected to be saved, and God makes that choice. And he goes, look, I want to stay a Presbyterian, but I want to preach this, and I'm going to preach this, and you can't stop me from preaching this. So they promptly excommunicated him. And he wasn't the only one. Thomas Campbell was one. Alexander Campbell was one. And this common idea, this simple idea that Jesus loves everybody is what caused Barton Stone and later on these early Restoration Fathers to say things like, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but the divine. Where do you think that came from? What they did was they took all the creeds away and all the walls away in favor of simply unifying under the New Testament as our only rule of faith and practice. And that's why the Christian Church, Church of Christ, became the fastest growing religious movement in America in the first half of the 1800s. Because another wall was coming down, another barrier was being removed. This became personal to me about seven years ago because what I found out was that Stone actually later moved to Illinois and he moved from Cane Ridge, Kentucky to Illinois because of his aversion to slavery. 
and his desire to spread the gospel in the American frontier. Even though slavery wasn't abolished or outlawed until 1848. I went to Restoration History at Ozark Christian College at 7 a.m. with a guy who didn't even move his lips when he talked. It was the hardest class to just stay awake in, right? And so I just wanted to get that class done. I wanted to uh, get those credit hours and move on. But when the crossing started a location in Hannibal, Missouri, um, and I was doing research on the location where we were putting the church, I found out that Barton Stone actually died in Hannibal, Missouri. And I didn't know that before. That he was in Jacksonville, Illinois. He went over to Columbia, Missouri at the age of 77 uh, to uh, encourage a group of pastors. And he got sick on the way back. And he died at his daughter's house, Amanda Bowen, right on Front Street by the Mississippi River. A year later, Alexander Campbell came to Hannibal just to stand in the house where Barton Stone had died. Well, that really piqued my interest. I wanted to know more. Restoration history started to root down and, was, and, and you know, I, I started, it was more than just facts and figures. It became personalities and, and stories and, and uh, it, it was close to me. And I found out that his wife Celia, he'd been married to her for 33 years. They had six children together, actually died in Hannibal and was buried in Hannibal. And so I, I made it my job to find her grave. She's buried on Cardiff Hill. I don't know how many of you have ever read Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn, uh, but Cardiff Hill was uh, where the cemetery was, uh, where uh, Injun Joe actually killed Doc Robinson and they blamed Muff Potter for it. And, and uh, <clears throat> Tom Sawyer was the one who had to testify in court about it. Anyway, I looked all through that cemetery into what you see behind me. That's Celia Stone's broken tombstone. You can't read it. And uh, I just felt like, you know, that's not right. So this is what our church did. Okay, you're going to have to fix that, Mr. Tech Dude. Because this thing is not working. There you go. That's what we replaced it with. It actually says the very same thing uh, that it said on her original stone. We had to chalk it to see what it said. But the bronze plaque down below actually commemorates who she is. Uh, the uh, iconic figure she is for the Restoration Movement. She was a pioneer to take uh, the message of the gospel west <coughs> at a time when it was very dangerous to do that. And, uh, she, uh, and they, they had moved from Cane Ridge, Kentucky because of their uh, aversion uh, to slavery. Um, so, what I see in Stone's life is a person who's tearing down walls. What I see in the Restoration Movement is a movement that wants to tear down walls. And so you would think maybe that because of what I've learned and the time I've been around, that I would have a pretty good understanding of the Restoration Movement, and I really don't. I'd studied about Alexander Campbell and Walter Scott and Raccoon John Smith and John T. Johnson and Samuel Rogers and even more contemporary people like Isaac Errett and P.H. Welshmer and David Lipscomb and J.W. McGarvey. But what if I was to tell you, and this is for my instrumental brothers and sisters, because non-instrumental people will, might, might very well know who I'm talking about. What if I were to ask you, who was the most influential leader of the Restoration Movement if you measured that by baptisms and church plants in the 20th century? Who would you say? What if I told you that there was a guy who by himself baptized 47,000 people? in his lifetime, and established over 350 churches. Can you tell me what his name is? He was a black preacher. I know. Are you Church of Christ? That's, that's why you know. No, not You're not, but you do know? I'm from the instrumental. You're an instrumental, but you know that it was a black preacher. I've read the standard. 
Oh, you read this? You read my story on him. No fair. Cheer. Okay. That guy in the middle. That guy in the middle's name is Marshall Keeble. Marshall Keeble was born in 1878. He was the son of former slaves. He was never educated beyond the seventh grade. He began preaching in 1897 and set aside his business interests to go into full-time evangelism in 1914. In 1930, he reported to the Gospel Advocate that he had baptized 15,000 people. B.C. Goodpastor wrote a book about him. In 1967, that number grew to about 47,000. In his lifetime, he established over 350 congregations. He conducted evangelistic services all over America, as well as Nigeria, Ethiopia, India, Singapore, and Korea. <clears throat> he uh, helped start schools uh, and hospitals in Nigeria. Uh, he was the first president of Nashville Christian Institute. Harding University um, bestowed him an honorary doctor of laws degree. He was an avid debater and uh, it was said he retired every opponent he ever faced. He was instrumental in the founding of Southwestern Christian College in Texas, which is the primary college for the African American Churches of Christ. He preached in brush arbors, tents, barns, and church buildings. He was shot at in Florence, Alabama. He continued preaching. <coughs> he showed compassion for the man and uh, stood between him and his arrest. He was beaten with brass knuckles on another occasion only to turn the other cheek as the man was quietly removed. At 89 years of age, he died, was honored by the governor of Tennessee. 3,000 people attended his funeral. And in his lifetime, he worked to overcome many obstacles for African Americans, both in education and in preaching. He broke through many cultural barriers that separated black and white people. <coughs> he was one of the most influential preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the 20th century. So how come I didn't know about him? How come you didn't know about him? I'm going to give you two reasons. Reason number one, he's Church of Christ, non-instrumental. Reason number two, he's black. You know what those two things are? They're walls. It's exactly what they are. They're walls that separate us from one another. I would have never known who he was if it wasn't for developing relationships with African American Church of Christ brothers and sisters that the Solomon Foundation was working with. So I, put, I wrote a story about him, and I wrote a story about unintentional racism, which I consider myself to be an unintentional racist. I, <clears throat> I didn't want to not know who he was. I asked my Bible college professors, presidents, who is this guy? Have you ever heard of this? No, never heard of him, never heard of him. How's that possible? You don't realize how high these walls are. I don't realize how high these walls are. That's the problem. I want you to look around at those uh, four young men. He called them his preacher boys. He would take him, them with him when he went on these preaching tours to teach them uh, about preaching. And I want to call your attention specifically to the guy who's in the lower right corner. Because as I continued to do my research, <clears throat> I wanted to know who these were. And that guy right there, I'm going to tell you something about him. He is one of the most important cultural figures of the 20th century. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about American culture. And I'm going to tell you his name. And most of you have never heard his name before. And it's a shame. His name is Fred Gray. How many of you heard of Fred Gray? Raise your hand. One? And that was, a, that, was that because of... You have? Because last night doesn't count. All right. Huh. I had the opportunity to interview Fred Gray. 
And uh, I just did this at David Lipscomb University. It was an incredible experience. It was like sitting down with history itself and interviewing history. It was absolutely an amazing experience. Fred Gray did more than literally anyone substantively for the civil rights movement in the United States. And I know that's a very big statement that I just made. And I'll tell you why. Because most of what happened that made the civil rights movement work in the United States happened in a courtroom. There were all sorts of visuals of the civil rights movement. There were boycotts, there were marches, there were all sorts of things. But the real substance of change happened in a courtroom. And not just any courtroom, the Supreme Court of the United States. And that's where Fred Gray did most of his work. Now, go ahead and take, uh, go to another picture. I'm not even going to try to mess with that thing anymore. Does yours, are you, you hear me? Yeah. Somebody let me know when that thing changes, okay? Because <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit about... Okay, that's a Getty image of Fred Gray as a young man. He's uh, standing in front of, you can't see the sign there, but it says Church of Christ. It's a Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, he's uh, 25 in that picture. He's a quiet southern gentleman. These are my words from an uh, upcoming article going in the January Christian Standard. He's a quiet southern gentleman, but he wields law like a warrior fueled with a deep conviction to his calling in life. His ability to recount facts and names remains instantaneous without regard to his nearly 88 years on this earth. He is instantly friendly, able to distinguish the lines separating the arena of ideas and the God-given value of every human being he comes in contact with. He's among the last champions of the earliest days of the civil rights movement who's still standing. He's the one who brought the heavy weight of the law to bear and with it changed a nation forever. Let me tell you who this guy was, who this guy is. How many of you heard of Martin Luther King? Oh, you all have heard about him. Okay, in Montgomery, Alabama, if you were black, you had a designated spot on, the, on a bus. It was on the back of the bus, right? And if there was an inordinate amount of white people that wanted to ride on that bus, even if you were on the back of the bus, you still had to give up your seat. And there was a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin who uh, actually school got let out early and she got on the bus and it was a time when more whites were on the bus and she was supposed to give up her seat and she refused to give up her seat. This is before Rosa Parks. And she refused to give up her seat and they sent her to jail. And Fred Gray's first case, because who wanted to hire a black lawyer in Montgomery, Alabama? His first case was for a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin. And uh, he got her out of jail. He got to be known a little bit in Montgomery. And he was uh, working uh, with the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP as a youth sponsor. And the other, the lady who was working as a youth sponsor was a girl named Rosa Parks. And so Rosa Parks and Fred Gray would have lunch together. And they started talking about the buses. And they started talking about racial segregation. And somebody needs to do something about it. And he was sharing about Claudette Colvin. And they decided over lunch that what they were going to do uh, was what you saw happen in history with Rosa Parks. And it became the Montgomery bus boycott. And they all met at a lady's house that went to one of the churches there. And they were trying to figure out who's going to be the spokesman for this. At the time, Fred Gray was 25 years old. Who's going to be the spokesman? Well, there were some people that were doing different things <coughs> at that time in Montgomery. Uh, but they could not find the actual voice that they wanted. And the lady who offered her house for this meeting to take place said, we have a new preacher in our church. He's very young, but he has a way to move people with words. 
wonder if you'd be interested in him. Fred said, well, I don't know. I don't know him. I, I know of him, but I don't know him. But if you think that he'd be okay, maybe we'll give him a try. He was 26 years old. Do you know who that was? That was Martin Luther King. Fred was 25. Martin Luther King was 26. Uh, Rosa Parks, about the same age. All a bunch of young people. That Montgomery boy, boy, bus, bus boycott didn't last one day like they had planned. It ended up lasting like 382 days. <clears throat> they got with a lady that uh, her husband owned all of the African American funeral homes in, in Montgomery and used all the funeral cars and hearses to move African Americans from home to their work since they were boycotting uh, buses. It's amazing to hear his story. The whole uh, situation with the arrest of Rosa Parks was something that they engineered over lunch. Fred Gray uh, was not only behind the Montgomery bus boycott, he also was the one who pretty much single-handedly desegregated all of Alabama schools, all the primary schools, all the secondary schools, all the colleges and the universities, because he couldn't go to the University of Alabama. It was an all-white school. He had to go up to Cleveland to get his graduate degree. And he was never able to march with all the rest of them because they would have disbarred him. They tried to do it anyway. He was behind the Selma Montgomery march. If you ever watched the movie Selma, Fred Gray is played by Cuba Gooding Jr. in that movie. He was the one behind the Tuskegee syphilis study. He has... Uh, uh, he's remembered in the Smithsonian Institution. He's recounted in his own autobiography called Bus Ride to Justice, The Life and Works of Fred Gray. It's an autobiography of a man who was thrust into one of the most pivotal periods of 20th century American history. His cases and his landmark rulings are required study for every lawyer today to pass the bar. And you probably wouldn't know that that guy, the entire time he was arguing in the Supreme Court, losing every case, he lost every case up to the Supreme Court, and he won every case the Supreme Court. You probably wouldn't know that the entire time he was doing that, he was a full-time minister in the non-instrumental Church of Christ. I got a couple more pictures of him. Uh, I think of me interviewing him. Well, let me know when it turns. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that's Fred and I walking down the hall at, uh, at David Lipscomb. And go to the next one. And that's, the two, that's me interviewing him and him talking to me. This is amazing, absolutely amazing man. Amazing lover of Jesus Christ. Now, why am I telling you all this? It's amazing to me how easily we put up walls and how difficult it is for them to come down. Now, if you were ever to say, what's the nexus between the Restoration Movement and the Civil Rights Movement? A lot of you would say, well, is there a nexus? Is there a, a connection between those two things? But understand, the African American churches of Christ are part of the brotherhood of the Restoration Movement. They're one of the streams of the Restoration Movement. And the only reason you don't know about it is because there's a wall there. And if there wasn't a wall there, you could say, that's not just part of someone else's heritage, it's part of my heritage. What am I losing out on? What am I missing? Just because... Things are only communicated this way instead of this way. And we don't get to have the opportunity of the richness of our movement as a whole. The Solomon Foundation is an organization that uh, lends money to churches. I was just in Atlanta. Uh, there's an a African American Church of Christ brother there named... Uh, uh, oh, what's his name? 
Orpheus Hayward, West End Church of Christ, building this great big building. They owned their building free and clear. They had bought the property for their new building, owned it free and clear. They had a million dollars in the bank, and they couldn't get any bank in Atlanta to give them a loan. They had perfect credit. You tell me why that is. Solomon Foundation decided we wanted to partner with African American Churches of Christ. So now we have $80 million invested in the African American Churches of Christ. And it's awesome to see what God's doing with it. These churches are growing like crazy. Now they're non-instrumental. Some of them are instrumental. But they're, and they're, some of them are non-instrumental. But there are brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is incredible. I want you to be able to see the benefit that can be ours if we have these relationships together. I want us to look at John chapter 17, 13 to uh, 33. This is the words of Jesus. He says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that you may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world anymore, than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. Listen to this. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, and that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you've sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Do I need to say it? Jesus is right. He's right. I'm better with you. You're better with me. That's it. There's so many things that really just don't need to divide us anymore. Race doesn't need to divide us. That needs to be over. It needs to be over in our churches. It needs to be over in our hearts. Denominations and creeds and missionary societies that divided us in the past, that, that's over. We agree that there's no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but the divine. We hold that we can be in unity while being in autonomy. We baptize by immersion into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We say, whosoever will may come. We believe that the Bible is God's word without error, and it's our only rule of faith and practice. <coughs> I can hear them on the other side of that wall. I want to know if you can hear them. There has to be a way forward. <coughs> there shouldn't be us and them. And it happens this way. Personal relationships. Forbearance. You know what forbearance is? It's making allowances for one another because you love each other. It's operating in grace. Forbearance. And for the sake of of the mission of the gospel so that the world might know. Those are the ways these walls come down. I want to conclude this with this. I passed around that piece of the Berlin Wall. My brother and I got to go to Germany together with our wives in 2002. It was this incredible trip. He'd been there many times. He was a CEO, and he'd been there many times for business, and he wanted to share that with me. I didn't know it, and neither did he. 
that he had terminal cancer at the time. It wasn't long, though, after he got back that he received a diagnosis. Now, my brother was a good man. He was a godly man. But he kept his commitment to the Lord kind of at arm's length. But not after that diagnosis. He started tearing down every wall in his life. And when he died a year later, he was at peace. Because there were no more barriers. I miss my brother every single day of my life. But you know what? God's provided me with countless brothers and sisters. If I can only figure out a way to embrace unity without compromising faith. And I'm praying that God helps me to do that. I don't have all the answers. I just want to be in the conversation. I want to pray for it. I want to long for it. I want to desire it. You pray with me? Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you're a perfect God, and so if we let you down, it's a nonstop process. But in all of that, we're thankful for the grace that only you provide. The grace to get us through all the shortcomings, all the inability. But Father, when you make us aware of a thing, help us not to sit back. Help us not to be on our heels. Help us to lean forward. Help us to be aggressive with love and grace. And take the ground in front of us. We worry so much about the White House or the State House. We need to be thinking about your house. And I pray, Father, I'm not just talking about a church building, but I'm talking about the residence of your Holy Spirit in my heart. And I pray, Father, that you change it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take one. All right. Uh, well, we're only halfway through restoration appreciation. I say that because we've heard Jim Amstutz uh, speak with us on Tuesday. Uh, we've now heard Jerry uh, with this wonderful message today. And there are two, two more components. So uh, for lunchtime, we'd like you as many as possible, especially a lot of our guests who've come uh, to be with us today, to join us for lunch. Um, in room 101, Woodard Hall, and both of our speakers will be with us for question and answer time from about 12 till 2. So grab your lunch. If you're headed to that conversation, jump to the front of the line and get your food at $5 for lunch and continue that conversation uh, afterward. I'm sure many of you have questions. And then on Sunday, it's a Restoration Appreciation Sunday, and that's kind of the last part of Restoration Appreciation Week is uh, that gathering and hopefully in your churches we'll find some concrete way uh, to remember the restoration movement and appreciate it. Uh, Jerry has brought some resources with us. We have uh, several of the magazines from uh, his publishing company, uh, Christian Standard and The Lookout I think are there. Uh, so come take them, look at them, take one home with you, learn a little bit about the magazine and learn more about uh, your heritage. So uh, God bless you at lunch. I assume we're doing chairs? Okay.